and your ancestors, like, they lived and died for you, and it's in their interest to see you succeed, and it's in their interest to see you um, have what you need to be well-resourced. So it's in your interest to cultivate a relationship with them. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Medicine Stories podcast. This is episode 19, and I am Amber Magnolia Hill. On this show, we explore the mythic journeys we undertake when coming to know ourselves through interviews with herbalists, story keepers, ancestral listeners, consciousness explorers, earth dreamers, and other wise folk. Story is medicine, magic is real, healing is open-ended and endless, and we are here to have conversations about all of these things. Uh, I have missed you guys. I have missed doing this show. It's been such an <laughs> unexpectedly transformative month for me. I um, I got shingles. So yeah, I flew to the Good Medicine Confluence in Durango, Colorado. Um, I taught three classes. I had my toddler with me and my husband, but it was still really hard and really depleting to be traveling and working while traveling with a 20 month old. Um, and I knew, I knew I was super depleted and super tired when I came back. And then two days later, I got some dental work done and it awakened the shingles in me, the shingles virus, the varicella zoster that had been sleeping since I got the chicken pox when I was four um, on the trigeminal nerve on the right side of my head. I, you know, it's the depletion and the low immunity and the exhaustion from traveling and then just boom, exacerbated and woken up by uh, the dental work. So, oh man, I was 10 days in before I figured out what it was and got a diagnosis in the ER and it was the most excruciating pain. And as in my head, um, <laughs> I read later that the trigeminal nerve in the head is the source of the worst pain a human can feel. And we all know that shingles is amongst the worst pain experiences a person can have. So it really put my whole experience into perspective. The, um, the intense head pain lasted for seven days. And this is before I figured out what it was. I just, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I, I just thought I had a really bad headache. I'm very prone to headaches in the right side. This is a much bigger story than what I can tell in this intro, but um, in the long run, <laughs> this experience really helped me put some of my bigger long-term health issues into perspective. And I'm seeking a lot of healing modalities that I had never looked at before because I'm sick of this head pain. I don't want headaches for the rest of my life. I don't want pain in the right side of my head, jaw, neck, shoulder, upper back forever. It really impedes my ability to work and to enjoy my life. And so in the end, I'm thankful that the shingles happened. Um, and now I feel like I know a lot about shingles too. I'm even thinking of maybe just doing a little mini podcast talking about everything I did and everything I learned and the things that are out there that I feel like are maybe misinformation. Um, but then, you know, as soon as I was feeling better from that, um, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband was in a serious paragliding accident. He is a professional paraglider. I've been doing it for years and years thousands of hours up in the air and he was up alone testing out a new wing on the day before leaving for a competition and we don't know what happened but he went down and it was just the worst worst text to wake up to from my sister it felt just like waking up to the phone call about our mom dying in a car accident two and a half years ago in that case it was me calling her but I woke up to a voicemail from my mom's husband that morning and um I can't, I can't even begin to put into words what the last two and a half weeks have been like going through this um, traumatic brain injury. He was in the trauma neuro ICU. So lucky that someone saw him very soon after he went down and called 911 because evening was coming on. And just luckily this woman looked out her window and saw him. And luckily there was a state of the art 
neuro ICU nearby that he could get care flighted to. Um, it, modern medicine is amazing, amazing for things like this. I'm so thankful. Um, you know, he would have died. Absolutely. And, and he has made an incredible recovery. So we just didn't know. We didn't know all this time. And we still don't know exactly um, how his recovery will be and exactly what his capacities will be. But he started communicating through hand gestures like three or four days in. And um, he's been moved to a to a rehabilitation center in a couple days now, which is phenomenal. The doctor said it's really been like a miraculous recovery. Um, but man, for so long, we just didn't know. And, you know, the more I learned about traumatic brain injury, I just, I really, really had to try to keep my mind in line when I would go down very scary rabbit holes of anxiety. I mean, I was really having like big physical anxiety symptoms like I haven't had in a long time. And um, it was just so scary, you guys. It was so scary. I learned so much, though, about traumatic brain injury. Someone gets a traumatic brain injury every three seconds in the United States, two and a half million people a year. This is a really big, like, silent epidemic. You know, it's given me some perspective and um, I'm just going to be a lot more patient and compassionate when I see people who look like they're struggling or maybe not understanding something or driving slowly because there's so many people out there whose brains have been hurt and aren't functioning the way they used to or at their full capacity. And you can't tell by looking at them. So big love to everyone whose life has been affected by that. You know, it's just one of those things that you just don't even think about. It's not on your radar at all until it happens to you. So thank you to everyone who is praying for Tyler and for my sister. Um, I'm just, I'm so thankful. I'm just like a wash in gratitude that it turned out this way. And man, I have been loving my family even harder and paying more attention to the moment. I've actually been meditating multiple times a day just to try to calm my mind and um, keep my body from going into anxiety and pain places. And it's been amazing, amazing how different my mind and body feel just after two weeks of meditating using the Calm app. I could not recommend this app anymore. My 11 year old showed it to me and I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you to the creators of the Calm app. Um, so something that was interesting, and this is going to segue us into this episode today and harkens back to the most recent episode also with Susie Hazen, um, is that so when I'm in crisis or whenever anything happens, just in general, actually, I... I'm always in information gathering mode. Like I read multiple books a week. I'm always reading things online, um, listening to podcasts and audiobooks all the time. But especially when like there's an illness or a crisis, like I was saying, I feel like I learned so much about shingles. You know, I treated it on my own. I got diagnosed at the ER, but I didn't take the prescription. Um, and so when this happened to my brother-in-law, I was just like, okay, well, how, what can I do to help him recover afterwards? What can my part be? Well, nutrition, because that's something I'm already really interested in. And so I was looking up things for nutrition for brain injury, nutrition for brains. And I realized that all the food and nutrition research I'd been doing the previous three months about optimal brain functioning, of course, also applies perfectly to traumatic brain injury because nourishing a brain is nourishing a brain, whether you're doing it for to help someone recover from an injury or for um, just optimal brain functioning and making your life go, um, I don't know, better, more, having more clarity. So that was kind of a cool moment for me. I was like, oh, I already know all this stuff because I've been reading all these books about mitochondria and brain function and high fat diets and ketogenic diet and stuff before this happened. It turns out it's the same thing. Um, and I do want to say, if you know someone with a traumatic brain injury, then the book, uh, How to Feed a Brain or Feeding a Brain, maybe, um, by a guy named K. 
Cavan. I'm forgetting his last name right now, but he has a podcast called Adventures in Brain Injury and a blog too. And it's amazing. And so his book is specifically geared towards helping someone recover from a TBI with nutrition. Um, it's fabulous. And his podcast is great too. I recommend it so much. And then for just general brain health, um, Dave Asprey, Headstrong, Dr. Mercola has a new book out about um, eating a high fat diet. So yeah, we, my, you know, I gave my sister the book, Kevin's book, and I'm, I'm excited to hopefully help her and help them implement this, this eating, this way of eating into their lives because I've been doing it for myself for the last few months. And so I loved it in our conversation today when, um, Darla brought up fat and how we talk about disordered eating and the fear of fat. Um, now after the shingles, I started seeing this Ayurvedic practitioner in my town named Michael, who's wonderful and very long questionnaire intake form. And he asked me if I've ever had an eating disorder. And I said, no. And he was like, wow, you're one of the only women I've had in here who hasn't. I was like, wow, that's crazy. I did used to cut myself. I used to cut the parts of my body that I thought were fat and ugly. Um, so it wasn't exactly an eating disorder, but it's still a manifestation of what this culture does to women and to our conceptions of ourselves and our sense of self-worth and self-love. Um, but, and on my last appointment with Michael, he was telling me that there's a concept in India. It's, oh, he gave me the word too, but I don't have my phone with me. It's a concept that means both fat and love. And I, and I did look it up. There are many, many, many different meanings of this word, but a lot of them are like fat, unctuousness, oil, oiliness. And then a lot of the meanings for this word are love, affection, caretaking, and so I just really love that idea. And as you listen to Darla and I speak about fat in this episode, I'm sure you have some sort of feelings about fat, especially if you're a woman, your own body fat, eating fat. Um, I want to clarify too with what we are, what Darla and I talk about here that eating fat doesn't make you fat. Eating sugar makes you fat. And protein can be broken, is broken down as a sugar in the body. So too much eating too much protein can also make you fat. But eating fat, high quality fats, the good fats, not the bad fats, um, just nourishes every single cell in the body and is especially important for brain function. So I just wanted to um, like drop that here in the intro. Further reading if that part of our conversation resonates with you, which I sure um, imagine that it will, like I said, for women especially. Um, Darla, well, let, let's talk about what we what else we talk about in this episode. Uh, we talk about ancestry uh, that's deeply embedded in the land, the grandmother hypothesis. I love this so much. I love this idea how diet culture keeps us separated from our ancestors. And I would add fear of fat, hatred of fat into that diet culture, of course. Um, disordered eating and how the fear of fat is pushing us away from what it means to be human. To learn about your ancestors' lives, look below the level of empire and what that means. We also talked about this in episode two of this podcast. Reclaiming kitchen wisdom as an act of resistance against the dominant patriarchal industrial food system. The medicine that people of mixed race are bringing to the world right now. Dreams as guideposts. A mythic matriarchal dreamscape story that Darla tells. And charting serendipity. When you're in the right story, nothing doesn't fit. So... Darla is going to be giving away two ancestral healing sessions for patrons of this podcast. Um, I did an ancestral healing session with her, and we talk about that at the very end of the episode. So listen all the way through to hear a little bit of what happened in my session with her. Um, she'll be giving away two free sessions to folks. And also there on patreon.com slash medicine stories will be a coupon code to get 20% off um, a session with her. 
So in an ancestral healing session, you will be guided to meet a well ancestral guide from each of your four primary lineages through your four grandparents. You don't need to know anything about or be in contact with your lineages for this process to work and to nourish you. You'll also have the opportunity to receive a blessing from your ancestors, to learn more about significant events that have happened to members of your lineage, and to discover the other-than-human spiritual allies associated with each of your lineages, and much more. So, yeah, check that out again at patreon.com slash medicine stories. There's a whole lot of other rewards now at this point. I think probably about at least 20 um, bonuses related to past episodes of the podcast and all the things we talk about here for as low as $2 a month. Thank you so much to my patrons. You make this possible very, very literally. You make this possible. Um, so real quick before I give you Darla's bio and then we get into it, I just want to say for my fellow highly sensitive people for whom, um, like audio issues can be difficult to listen to. Um, there are some in this recording, but it's just the first like five or 10 minutes. There's, uh, some dogs barking for a minute. It drops out a few times. And this is my first international call ever. Uh, Darla's in Costa Rica. But it all smooths out really quickly after that. So if those things bother you, don't worry. Power through, stay strong, and it won't last for very long. Um, Darla Antwine, I I hope I didn't say Antoine earlier. That's how it's spelled, but it's pronounced Antoine. Darla Antoine is a mixed race Okanagan tribal member, ancestral activist and healer, mother, and accidental homesteader in the high mountains of Costa Rica. Darla helps mixed race and mixed culture seekers become rooted into place and lineage by combining her master's degree in food and culture, ancestral healing, and her own experiences as a mixed race woman and expat. So I think that's it. I'm so happy to be doing the podcast again. I have a lot of interviews booked uh, this summer. So many. I don't even, (laughs) I'm worried about having the time to do them all. But again, these experiences, the shingles, and then this very scary accident that my brother-in-law was in, um, they've really slowed me down. They've really put my life in perspective. I've gotten a lot more organized in the last month, just having to take so much downtime to recover and to be there for my sister. I should maybe mention too that she and I are really close and that she and her husband are really close. <laughs> like they've got the they've got the best marriage I know. Um and I'm just, you know, I was so worried that she would lose him. Like, you know, we just lost mom. I I just kind of my mama bear kicked in wanting to take care of her and being so, so worried about her, um, and him, but worried about her worrying about him. And, you know, you know, these things, such a large, um, circle of people who, who are affected and who care. And anyway, I really, feel like I've kind of snapped out of my go, 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 do, do, do panic every time you open your phone and see a new email or notification um, mindset. And I have even stronger boundaries up now around my time and feel totally committed to really deep daily self-care, doing everything within my power to not get so depleted again that this sleeping virus gets reactivated or any other, any other issues that could possibly be activated by stress and low immunity. I want to avoid that as much as possible. So I need to change my mindset and my patterning around work and stress and anxiety and feeling the need to be everything to everyone and to accomplish and produce. Um, so thank you also for all of your patience. I think I lost like two patrons, even though I didn't put a podcast out for a long time, a month or something. 
Um, and who, they might have left for other reasons too. But I just feel very grateful to everyone who's been patient, kind, loving, supportive through this small hiatus that I had to take. Um, like life, life is hella real and this stuff happens. And um, I feel grateful to have the space around me to let it unfold, to change, to grow, to learn, and then to be able to bring those gifts back to you, to my listeners and to the people that I love, the people in my life. So thank you. And let's get into this conversation now with Darla Antoine. Hi, Darla. Welcome to the Medicine Stories podcast. Hi, Amber. I'm really happy to be here today. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. And I would like to start by thanking you for being incredibly understanding and kind when I had to cancel twice, I believe. This is our third attempt and we finally made it. Yeah, no problem at all. I totally understand. Um, okay, there's a lot to get into. I haven't done an interview in over a month. I've had a lot happen between now and then. So... Um, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> but there's um, so much rich, uh, so many rich medicine stories that you have that I am really excited to to dive into with you. Yes. Um, <laughs> are those your sister-in-law's dogs or a dog? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to escape them. I'm going to go into the closet. <laughs> Oh, yep. I've done that during podcast recording, but that was to escape my crying baby. That too, yeah. (laughs) Oh, man. If I tried to do this in my house, my dog would ruin everything. He's such a little yappy barker. I know. I, well, hopefully the dog will stop barking. I've got I've gotten far away from the dog as I can get. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I wanted to just ask to start by um, inviting you to talk about your childhood and this connection that you have with your maternal ancestors. I believe it's your your mother's mother's line, if that's yes. correct, and how that led you into the work you're doing now. So, yeah, feel free to go anywhere there. I know there's a lot there. Okay, sure. Um, Yeah, I grew up in my maternal ancestral homelands in the Okanagan Highlands of Washington State. I'm an enrolled Okanagan tribal member. Um, The Okanagan, we call ourselves the the Silks, and it's a tribe whose traditional homelands sort of cover central and eastern, um, southern British Columbia and northern Washington state. And on the Washington side of the border, we are known as the Colville. And I have some family members who enrolled with the Colville and some who are enrolled with the Okanagan. I could s- just like trivia. I could, s- I could enroll with the Colville, but I couldn't, I can switch once. You can switch sides once. Um, I grew up in Washington State, so a lot of my other family members have chosen to enroll with the Colville because they're on the the U.S. side of the border. Um, My grandmother, although she was born in Canada, she remained, raised her children in Washington, and she remained enrolled in the Okanagan. So, yeah, we've just followed that lineage, and since she never enrolled with the Colville, none of us did either. (laughs) Um, So, anyway... Um, I grew up in my ancestral homelands, like I said, and so I had this deep sense of rootedness that I didn't appreciate until I left home, of course, but I knew the names of all of the mountains, I knew stories that went back many generations, like, oh, your great-great-uncle got his first deer over here, and um, there was this story about so-and-so and this happening over there by that lake, and just really being centered and... Um, Membered into the landscape. And wow, that also, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, even people today who have really strong ancestral connections, so few of us have that actually embedded in the land. Yes, yes. And, and like I said, I didn't really appreciate it until my 20s when I wasn't living there anymore. And part of that also has to do with just being from the area of the of North America that we're from, like a lot of tribes were pushed into the Midwest, even if they were from 
um, what we would now consider the East Coast. And so even if they retained their tribal communities, they lost their connections to the landscape. Um, so when I was old enough to appreciate this <laughs> and I went away to, I went two hours away to, for undergraduate school and I, that's when I really started realizing how different I was from like, say these city kids who were coming from Seattle. And I really wanted to understand my own identity in the way it was shaped by where I grew up and how I grew up and by the landscape. So I, um, I first went into journalism. I have an undergraduate degree in journalism and mass communication. And then I spent a decade working mostly for native media. I was a producer for Native America Calling, which is a weekly or a daily radio show, um, public radio show that is syndicated nationwide. And then I was a columnist for Indian Country Today, the largest native centered newspaper, and now it's an online media platform. Um, so I spent a decade interviewing and centering other indigenous stories for the most part, and that was fantastic. <laughs> but then along the way, I also went into graduate school and um, at the University of New Mexico, where I um, got a master's degree in intercultural communication. And I used that to really deepen into these questions I'd been carrying most of my adult life, which is how am I connected to my ancestors through landscape, which I, I um, honed in on more as through food, because food springs up from the landscape, and it's a bridge between our bodies and the landscape, really. Um, and in part, this came also because my grandmother was put into the residential boarding school system in the 1930s, that was designed to kill the Indian and save the man inside every indigenous person. And this happened in the U.S. and Canada up until the 1970s. People don't realize that, it, that these boarding schools existed so recently. And so she was forcibly assimilated. Um, her first language was Okanagan, uh, which is a, a dialect of um, interior Salish. And, but then she was forced into this boarding school where she could only speak English, and she then only spoke, we call it speaking Indian, she only spoke Indian um, when she was anesthetized and like she was coming out of a surgery, which only happened a couple of times in her life, or when she was with one of her siblings. And towards the end, she only had one sister who was still alive. My grandmother passed in 2011. She was in her mid-80s. She had um, one sister left alive, and they passed near each other just within a few weeks. And the last time they saw each other, I was there, and my grandmother tried to speak in Salish to my great aunt. And my great aunt was so wounded around this language wound that she just looked at my grandma like my grandma was speaking a crazy language, and she didn't understand it, and she just said, Oh, what are you talking about? You're talking, you're talking gibberish. You're talking nonsense. And she wouldn't even engage in the, in their mother tongue with her. Which, wow, <laughs> that's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Is there anything um, that you'd like to pick up on from from what I said? Well, do you um. Have you explored that language more, or like, what is the status of that language right now? Um, it's. I believe the language is. It's definitely near death, but there are revitalization programs happening that I have been interested in since I was a young teenager. So over twenty years, I've been interested in learning the language. I know a few words. Um, but the funny thing is, my ancestors have known that I am very interested in my maternal ancestral lineage, which is also my mitochondrial DNA. And, you know, if there's, if you're going to be attached to one lineage and specifically, it makes sense that it would be your maternal lineage if you identify as a woman. And I do. <laughs> so all of that said, um, I've, and I've put a lot of my academic and intellectual work towards my ancestry. 
And for all of that, <laughs> and for all of my interest and my willingness and my saying, okay, ancestors, I'm here, lead me, do what, um, have me do what you would, they have taken me on the craziest trip. So um, <laughs> after grad school, I was sure that I would move back to Washington State, maybe even Southern British Columbia, and either go on to get my PhD or start working with the tribe, doing something. But instead, they put this um, redheaded Costa Rican in my path, <laughs> <laughs> and we had a whole bunch of serendipitous magic around our love story. And I moved to Costa Rica, and um, we live on a highland farm, 10,000 feet above sea level. We have two little boys, and I'm raising my kids where I have zero roots. And my husband, his fam he's white. His parents came from Michigan. They immigrated when they were pregnant with him in the late 1970s. And then before that, his, his ancestry is from Scotland. Scotland. And so he's got very little roots here as well. However, he's got a deep connection to the land that we live on because he spent most of his childhood there as well. So, yeah. And so instead of Okanagan, I'm learning Spanish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of rooting deeper into my homelands, I am rooting into Costa Rica um, and raising my children here as well. And I know that there will be a full circle moment at some point in my life. But I've really had to learn to not get attached to what that looks like and when that's going to happen. Mm. And you said to me, too, that you feel like it's a sort of healing after your your family, your grandmother specifically was removed, forcibly removed from her home and from her culture in these boarding schools that now you are choosing to be removed from your homeland and raising your children far away. Yes. Yes. My ancestors have, cause I've asked them like, why? Like, this is not what I, when I told you I was here and willing to do what needed to be done, this is not what I expected that would be done because there seems to be more urgent matters at home in our homelands. And one of the things they told me was that, yes, that me leaving in the homelands by choice and for love and learning another language for those same reasons was very healing for the generations that, um, we're forced to do that. Hmm. Um, maybe you can tell us As more. Versus loving consequences. Oh, I'm sorry that I cut you off. It keeps um, dropping out for a minute. So I think <laughs> I thought you had stopped talking. Oh, okay. This is my first international uh, recording. So every now and then I just lose you for a second. Um, yeah, tell us more about like how it is that you connect to and talk to your ancestors and how it is that you are receiving communication back from them. I think this is something a lot of people are very interested in, but don't know where to start or think it's just too out there or mystical or beyond their capabilities when it's really something that we are all um, able to do with a little effort. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um so what I believe about our ancestors is, one, they are the closest spiritual beings to us, um, maybe except perhaps like in the plant and animal and elemental kingdom who share this earth realm with us in a sense. But in terms of like spiritual, former human um, types of spirits, they are the closest ones to us because we share blood and marrow and DNA with them. And so for most of my life, my ancestors have just spoke to me through that quiet inner voice or through my intuition. It's only been recently that I've realized that all along that was my ancestors in part guiding me. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I just speak to them through my inner voice or out loud if I need to. And I trust to know that they've heard me just because they're a part of me. And then I wait to see what kind of guidance comes up. Um, serendipity, I follow serendipity a lot. Like what is showing up? What is more than a coincidence? Um, along with that inner voice. And then after moving here to Costa Rica and after becoming a mother, that was certainly a huge identity death. And it was very spiritually mentally, emotionally painful to go through that death. Um, 
of my former identity and, all, and being removed from friends and family and all of that. So I turned to spiritual work, and that's when I started meeting um, other healers who did ancestral healing work. And now I've trained to also be an ancestral healer. And so with those modalities come other ways of talking to the ancestors, which is basically kind of the same, same thing, is you just intentionally center yourself and get quiet and then call on your ancestors and um, train yourself to feel their presence and to hear their voices. But the, the caveat is to make sure you're calling on well ancestors because just because someone is dead doesn't mean they're all-knowing or all-beneficial. They might still have wounds and traumas and addictions that they're looking for an outlet for. And then if you call on them, they're like, oh, great, I have access to your body because we kind of have the same uh, link here between our DNA. And I really have this trauma and this wound that I never healed, so I'm just going to give it to you since you're in a physical form, and I'm going to let you deal with it. And then all of a sudden you're dealing with all sorts of chaos and physical symptoms that are unexplainable, and you don't know what's going on. So it's really important to, to, to use the caveat when you're calling on your ancestors to call on your well ancestors, your healed ancestors. Mm, that makes, um, uh, yeah, it's hard for me to put into words, but I feel this, I feel the same way about like, we're so, we are so connected to these people. We are made from their bodies. We are made from their bodies. So mm. like, you know, I think, I don't know about reincarnation, but when people talk about that idea, I think of it more as like the strong ancestral resonances we have. And maybe it is more of like a very specific, actual reincarnated soul in a different body. I don't know, but it's definitely a strong resonance that we can have with one or more ancestors or one or more ancestral line. Um, did you listen to my interview with Stephen Herod Buner and the the African man that he quotes talking about calling on the ancestors. Yes, I listened to the interview and I haven't done his meditation. Was it his him that had the heartbeat meditation? Sean Donahue's heartbeat Sean, meditation. Okay, yeah. Yes. That so that's on yeah. um patreon.com slash medicine stories for the listeners. That's amazing. But Buner talks about how he was speaking to an African man and or he I think he maybe read this in a book. I don't remember. But he does tell the story um, in that interview. I think it's episode eight of the podcast where he was asked, do you pray to God? And he said, oh, no, we don't we don't pray to God. God is very busy and too far away. Uh, we pray to our ancestors because they're still right here. And they remember yes. what it what it was to be embodied as a human. Yes, I agree with that completely. That's been my experience. Totally. Yeah, gods and goddesses are too far away. You really have to put in lots of legwork and years and years and years of showing up consistently to actually get the attention of a deity. And your ancestors, like, they lived and died for you. And it's in their interest to see you succeed. And it's in their interest to see you um, have what you need to be well-resourced. So it's in your interest to cultivate a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Yes, this reminds me, too, of what um, my episode 7 guest uh, Lara Valeda Vesta told us about the concept of the Desir in the Northern European um, tradition, which is like the female ancestors of your lineage who who are watching out for you, who are there for you, who are totally invested in your life, in your embodied experience as their descendant. And I love that idea so much. And I, I hope to be a Desir myself someday because... You know, as a mother, like your whole your whole life is bent toward your children's lives and making sure they are the best they can possibly be. And I can imagine, you know, after death, wanting to continue that um, nurturing of your descendants down the line. Absolutely. And I know we're both mothers and not yet grandmothers, but I can also like in seeing my mother become a grandmother, I can see how she even has more space and room to nurture my children than mm -hmm. she did when she was in the thick of it of raising me and my sisters. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine it's the same thing, like how we're going to be with our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, great-great-great-grandchildren, even if we're just there for them in spirit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you know about the grandmother hypothesis? No, I don't. It's... um. <laughs> It's this idea in like anthropology, I guess. I'm sure it reaches across many more disciplines, but 
um, the idea is that most other animals don't ever go out of um, fertility. You know, they can like have babies really up until the end of their lives, the females. But, you know, with humans, we hit menopause at a relatively young age. We still have decades left in our life if we're lucky when we become um, infertile. And so the reason for that, this theory holds, is that it's so we can stick around longer to help raise our grandchildren. And that Mm -hmm. is one of the reasons that the human species has been so resilient and so, quote, successful in terms of like population growth um, is because we have grandmothers to nurture our young and support our mothers. Wow, that makes the hairs on the back of my neck raise up. <laughs> yeah, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and it yeah, makes that's amazing. so much sense. And for me, besides just actually like missing my mom so much and who she was, such a big part of my sadness is that she's not here to help me. <laughs> she's not mm-hmm. here to watch her granddaughters grow up. She's not fulfilling that role that was her favorite role. She loved being Grammy. And that um, was just, it's just such a natural part of being human. Yeah, and that's one of the things I love about ancestral healing, too, is it does give you a bridge to keep working and being in relationship with your mother, mm-hmm. even after she's passed on. Absolutely, yeah. I was talking to her right before we started this call. <laughs> oh. Um, so... Yeah. So there's so much to talk about. Um, I'm curious about, well, let's talk about the food, the food piece of it. Now, I love what you said, that food is like the bridge between the land and the ancestors. And then your currently alive human body. That's um, that's really beautiful. And so did you grow up eating ancestral foods? And how do you now work with food? And how do you um, work with other people and, t- you know, telling them how to use food to connect with their ancestors? Um, yeah, so I, I grew up eating some ancestral foods, um, I'm a child of the 80s, so mm-hmm. <laughs> lots of processed food <laughs> yep. um, in my childhood, and, but um, where I, in my homelands, we have um, huckleberries, and huckleberries are sort of a type of wild blueberry, but they cannot be domesticated, so um, you have to just go out into the forest when it's huckleberry season and pick huckleberries if, if you want huckleberries, um, which I love that. I love that it's something that can't be domesticated, and it's something my ancestors have been picking and storing and eating for thousands and thousands of years, as far as I know. So huckleberry season was always a big deal. Um, at Thanksgiving, we always had sort of a traditional American Thanksgiving meal, but we also often had a salmon alongside the turkey. Um, it's just sort of a quiet homage um, to the ancestors and to our roots. Um, so little things like that I, I noticed and really picked up on. Um, when so So when I moved away from home, which the first time I moved a significant distance away, I I was married to um, my first husband. We got married really young, and we moved to Iowa um, from Washington. He's from Washington as well. And he was going to grad school, and I was working for a newspaper. And so cooking became – I started teaching myself how to cook different meals, and um, I really reached back into what foods of my ancestors and brought them – to Iowa as sort of my comfort food, as sort of my way of um, alleviating my homesickness. And then when I decided to go to grad school as well, I, I, I held on to that idea and I studied how food creates and sustains our cultural identities matrilineally. And I wrote my thesis on the topic. And then um, after... I finished grad school, and that's when I moved to Costa Rica, and then I got pregnant very soon after. And it's only been, like, in the last year that I've really had the space. My children are now five and almost four. Um, So now I've kind of got some space to revisit all of that that I've learned and that I've experienced, and I'm bringing it. Right now I'm working on a course to bring to people who are interested in connecting to their ancestors and perhaps who have... um, uh, are tired of participating in diet culture. I believe that diet culture is something 
that is intentionally um, keeping us away from our ancestral power and our ancestral wisdom because it is shaming the, the typical foods of our ancestors. It is disconnecting us from them. It is disconnecting us from kitchen skills and gathering in the kitchen, which is where rebellions can begin and where uh, rebellious thoughts are expressed is around a kitchen table with a home-cooked meal, right? And I think there's a really... The patriarchy has a really invested interest in keeping us away from that, those skills and away from those um, gatherings. Um, that is so powerful. <laughs> that Yeah, that idea. And then also the diet culture as being really oppositional to our ancestral food ways that, I mean, you just caused a really big paradigm shift in my mind with, with that concept. Yeah, well, I was listening to your podcast a couple of weeks ago, and you were talking to a woman about how, like, you used to be vegan, and then you, your body, when you were pregnant, your body just really started craving some animal products, and now, then you found nourishing traditions, and now I think you eat more of a primal diet, is that correct? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I've never been vegan, I mean, I've been vegan for short stretches of time, just as, like, a cleanse. But um, I think, I think, but I've had eating disordered issues. I, I starved myself a lot in my younger years. I was afraid of fat. And as a consequence, I had horrible acne and horrible menstrual cramps because I did not have enough fat in my growing body. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I became pregnant with both of my children, I gained like 80 pounds. I went from like 100, no, 60 pounds. I went from like 120 pounds to 180 pounds with both pregnancies, even though I was eating healthy and exercising and moving, but my body was just like, we're holding on to all everything that we can. <laughs> <laughs> and that really changed my, also my relationship with my body and with diet. And that's when I also started making the connections between not only does food it not only is food an expression of our, ident our cultural identities, but there's something else going on here that's ancestral. Um, and I think it's really important to listen to our bodies over our ideologies, right? Because our ideologies can be really well-intended, but they can also have big blind spots that um, our, bo our bodies are then trying to make up for. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, my diet has changed a number of times. And each time I'm so fully believing in what I'm doing, because mm, the book presented it so well, or there, the research is there, you know, you can cite research to back up any way of eating that you're interested in. Um, and there's always something new to prove or disprove something. Yep, absolutely. And it's, yeah, it's just so overwhelming and frustrating and confusing. Um, and so eating in this way, eating your ancestral foods, like there's nothing confusing about that. Um, exactly. And our ancestors didn't waste their precious brain energy on worrying about how many almonds they ate today or <laughs> on whether or not they should go ahead and eat that trout they just caught. Mm -hmm. um, they did not worry about that. And so what are we missing out on by wasting good energy on, on, on those sorts of issues? And yet, you know what, I, I bet you would say that veganism served you for a time. But thank the ancestors that when your body started telling you that this is not working any longer, you listened. Mm -hmm. And that's fine too. That's, a, that's the thing too, is we get so caught up in thinking, this is how I'm going to eat forever. And we're not meant to do that. We're, we think of the seasons and eating cyclically eating in season. Our ancestors never eat the same thing all year round. We're not supposed to eat the same thing all year round. And especially for women and especially if we become mothers, we, take, we, get on, we get into different seasons of our life and we need different nutrition for those different seasons. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Our bodies are always changing. And um, this fat piece is, I'm really thinking like, so my youngest now is 21 months and I have not lost the belly fat like at all. And it's really, I have to constantly be like 
watching my mind when I get Mm. really upset about that. And like, I just want to fit into my jeans again. And like, I don't want to be in a bathing suit this summer. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I just, can we just, once we stop breastfeeding, this fat better just melt away. (laughs) And like, but I know, I know it's there for a reason. I know it's there because I'm still nursing her and maybe it won't go away when I stop nursing. But I also know that it's a really important um, backup and reserve of fat so that I can keep producing this milk that she still is getting and that I still very much want her to be getting. And um, this, you know, just American, incredibly misguided fear of fat that luckily a lot of people are starting to realize is totally unfounded and so unhealthy for us. Um, it, it's an interesting, now that I'm framing it in terms of like our ancestral life ways that being afraid of fat is really pushing us so far away from what it means to be human. Yeah. And the woman, I mean, imagine if you didn't have these negative voices in your head telling you that these couple extra inches of fat are horrible and you need to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. What if instead you still lived in a culture that was like, look at your amazing, beautiful body. My goodness, you got a little extra pudge. It Mm -hmm. looks really nice. Mm -hmm. You're nursing, you're creating life. Like, let's honor and revere that. Yeah. Yeah. You're building a brain (laughs) in another person. You're building your own brain. Um, And cells, you know, every cell in the body needs fat. It's just so important. Um, So this is reminding me of something that I talked about in episode two with Mila Prince. And this is something that my friend um, says from her teacher, Martine Prechtel, um, Eve Bradford is her name, that if you want to like really connect with your ancestors on a deeper level, you have to look below the level of empire. So not looking at the history books, not looking at what white dudes wrote down about what happened, but going to the foods and the lullabies and the folk tales and the myths and the herbal remedies. Um, and I love that idea. And that's something that I've seen when I when I speak that in classes. I just see people's faces soften or smile or get tears in their eyes uh, because that's something that we're really missing in this culture. All of those things that I just named, you know, real foods, um, herbal medicines and fairy tales and myths. That's something we're missing so deeply in this culture and that people are craving So I can imagine that it's really powerful for you and the people you work with and anyone who hears these words to think about starting to reconnect with their ancestral foods. Yes. Yeah. Um, One of the things, speaking of that, um, I really really love that. I've I've heard it before and I've heard you mention it before as well about looking below the level of empire. And one of the best and easiest ways to do that for most of, most of us is we can find um, a recipe box or a recipe book or anywhere that any of our ancestors have written down recipes in the last couple hundred years. Um, those recipes have a language of their own, and that's like direct transmission of information. You can read that recipe a hundred times, and each time pick up a little bit of something about the life of the woman who wrote that recipe. Um, You can analyze how much detail she goes into in the cooking instructions. Little detail means she was very comfortable in the kitchen and or she expected the woman she was writing the recipe for to to be skilled in the kitchen. Um, to a certain degree where shorthand is appropriate and short, sh- shortening the steps is appropriate. And then, so when reading that, the bits and pieces where your own information is missing, well, right there and then you have sort of an assignment to fill in that knowledge gap and um, skill yourself in the kitchen to the degree that you can make this recipe um, following your ancestors' instructions. And that being able to skill yourself in the kitchen, being able to cook food for yourself and your family is revolutionary in this day and age because the empire has tried to make us dependent on outside systems that someone else controls in getting our food and our nourishment. Um, 
and maybe for some of us, like I know you and I both live out in the country, so for better or worse, we have to do most of our own cooking. <laughs> some nights I really wish I didn't have to, but there's no other option. Um, so it might be different for, for, for women like us, but for other women who are living in more urban settings and if they grew up in urban settings, just reclaiming those recipes and then filling in their knowledge gaps in the skill in the kitchen skills can really be powerful for them. Yeah, I've recently been listening to um, Dr. Zach Bush on a lot of podcasts. I talked about this in the last episode with Susie Hazen, too. It's Z-A-C-H. He um, is a triple board certified doctor and just amazing knowledge about health and gut health and soil health, like next level everything. I'm loving it. But one thing he really talks about is um, yeah, how, how food systems control the population. And we've never had a food system on earth like we do now, especially in America, mm. especially in the West, where we are totally dependent on this industrialized food system to feed ourselves. And if that falls apart and collapses, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, there's not. So it's this power that we've given away. And it's no individual's fault, especially the younger generations. We were born no. into this, you know, yes. speaking of, um, recipes like when my grandma died we found her recipe book and we always loved her food so much you know this is four years ago so I'm looking through it and I'm like oh my god it's all cans of Campbell's mm. soup basically mm -hmm. like every every single thing she cooked had Campbell's mushroom soup in it and it was just all processed or canned food thrown together in different combinations and I was really realizing like she didn't know how to cook and she was the first person in her line to lose that because I know her mother did. I know her mother, like, you know, had her own garden and raised her own animals. And um, so that for for many of us, that knowledge is actually quite a few generations gone now. Yeah, that's true. And I would I would suggest then to, like, deconstruct the recipe further and be like, OK, this calls for a can of Campbell's mushroom soup. How do I make mushroom soup from scratch? And you know what? I did this recently, and mushroom soup from scratch is incredibly easy to make. <laughs> incredibly easy. Like, I don't know why anyone would buy it in a can. It takes 10 minutes and, like, three ingredients. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, um, of course, always, you know, other other ways that you can find the recipes or, or the yeah. foods that, that if yes. you know where they lived and around what time, it's really fun to to dive into that. Um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about your dream practice and maybe we can start kind of segue into this by you telling me about the, the dream that you had about the medicine that people of mixed race are bringing to the world right now. Oh yeah. Um, so I've always been a pretty good dreamer. Um, having vivid dreams since I was a child and remembering them and have looked to my dreams for guidance since, I don't know, eight or nine years old when I realized that was a thing. I heard other people talking about, <laughs> about it somewhere. Um, so just a, a year ago, less than a year ago, I signed up for an ancestral healing training with um, Dr. Daniel Four, F-O-O-R, and I signed up for this training, but it hadn't started yet. But this new energy was coming into my life, and then I had this dream. And one of the things I have always wondered about, because I feel so connected to my Okanagan lineage, but I'm mixed race. I am um, uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, and my father are both white. And I've always been like, but I am so invested in this lineage and I care about it so much. How come I couldn't have just been born like full blooded on the reservation, like ready to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to get into action and be immersed in the community. I've always been sort of an insider outsider because I was not raised on the reservation. And, um, it's always been the, my Okanagan, community and cultural heritage has always been like arm's length away rather than right here present with me. And I've really had a lot of wounding around that and a lot of questions around that. So as that preamble, the dream I had 
was I was in a room and there was um, a disembodied presence separating all of the indigenous people. Um, this was like a room that represented the United States. And I also knew that this same thing was happening all over the world where the indigenous people were being forced out and separated. And at one point for our European lineages, this happened to them too. It just happened a long time ago when the Romans came and invaded um, the Celtics, for, for example. Um, so the, um, I saw my indigenous ancestors being put into a room and inside that room they were crucified. And they, but the, the crucifixion happened on an X instead of like a Christian cross. I'm not sure what the symbolism of that means yet. But anyway, they were being crucified. And they were being silenced. And they were being killed off. And I saw this happening throughout time. And then as this disembodied force that was doing this came closer and closer to my generation... Um, there were more of us who were mixed race. And the disembodied voice or presence sort of um, insinuated that I could go into that room and be crucified with my um, indigenous ancestors and therefore be indigenous like them. Or since I had white blood, I could stay outside and I could be white. I had the choice. And I saw um, other... Native people choose to go in. I saw other Native people choose to go out that were mixed blood. And I chose to go out, and I exchanged a look with some of the other mixed-blooded um, Indigenous relatives of mine, where we knew that this was a lie, that there was never a choice, and that if we stayed out of that room, if we refused to be crucified with our ancestors, that we could start praying and acting on their behalf, and that we could probably... Um, we could rescue them, and we could rescue the future generations. So I woke up from that dream, like, immediately, and I just, like, it made so much sense to me. And it was, like, the answer to a question I'd had my whole life is, oh, I now understand more of my role of, as an insider-outsider. Now, that is not to say that just because you are um, a, a um, fully immersed Indigenous person that you are going to be crucified and that you're powerless, not at all. Um, but that was definitely um, illustrating my own personal path along this, in this lifetime. That's incredible. <laughs> that's like, wow. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Like as, as you phrased it, that a question you'd had your whole life was answered in a dream. Yeah. And I think, I, and I very, I very much feel that it, it it came right after I signed up for this ancestral healing mm -hmm. for a reason. It was speaking to healing that I meant to bring and provide to my ancestors. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is my own personal path. If other people may resonate with the dream and others might not, depending on if their path is similar to mine or not. Mm -hmm. Um, let's, let's talk about another dream. This, this dream you had about the shift between the matriarchy and the patriarchy. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. So I mentioned earlier that I was married before. Um, I was married for about five years, um, in my early twenties. And my husband, my then husband and I, we moved to Spain, um, I was finishing grad school, and he was finishing. He was going to school to become a chiropractor, and so for like his last year of school, he had to work under another chiropractor. So we decided to go to Spain, and he worked for an American chiropractor who lived in Spain. Uh, ever since I was little, I've also always had this weird thing where I knew I was going to need to know how to speak Spanish, and I knew I was going to live in a, a foreign country. <laughs> Um, and so I thought this was it. This was the Spain, the Spain trip was it. Um, but the marriage was falling apart. We were too young. We spent too much time apart. Anyway, I was, the ball was in my court. Did I want to stay in the relationship or did I want to leave the relationship? And I woke up from this dream and I knew that I needed to leave the relationship. And this dream, I, a woman 
about my age, mid-20s at the time, was leading me to a beach. And this felt like a long, long time ago, like thousands of years ago. And there were a bunch of other women huddled up on the beach in small groups. And so she led me to the beach and into the small group of women. And every time the tide, um, every time a wave came and broke in on the shore, one of us would reach down into the sandy water and cup up a handful, throw it up into the air in the middle of the circle and call out an attribute that we wanted to make sacred. So um, resilience, beauty, justice, equality, um, things like that. And every small group of women, there are probably 20 circles of women, were doing this up and down the beach. And as we did this, the water and the sand and the salt started to form an image in the middle of the circle. And I realized that we were creating deities. We were creating goddesses to preserve our wisdom and our, our, um, our ethics and our values because a big shift was coming and we didn't quite understand it, but we knew that all of these things that we valued were going to be under attack and possibly even killed, but we could hide them. So we were hiding them in these deities that we were creating. And then when we were all done, in my group that I was in, we had, we had created Medusa. <laughs> and um, we named her Medusa, but we told, we agreed that we would tell the men that her name was Medea. Because if they didn't have her true name, they couldn't have power over her. And then I woke up. And I had never once heard of Medea before, um, so I got online and I started Googling Medea and I found out she's a, a, a character in the story of Jason and the Golden Fleece. Jason needs to get this Golden Fleece. Um, Medea is an herbal woman. She's a kitchen witch and she helps Jason finish his tasks that he needs to do and he agrees to marry her and they're married and they have children and then he leaves her for someone else and the story is that Medea then kills their children in revenge and scholars scholars don't quite agree with that narrative or with that reasoning so there's some room up for debate about that but what I read that sunk with me that was true for her coming to me in a dream was that Medea was the patron was the unofficial patron saint or patron patron um, demigoddess for divorced women <laughs> and I was considering getting a divorce so I was like okay all right I got the story loud and clear and um, we did eventually um, get a divorce I made my decision firm that I was going to get a divorce but of course it took a little while to actually um, for that process to evolve and then I found out, the more research I've done, that there are links between Medea and Medusa. I mean, first they've got the M-E-D mm -hmm. at the beginning of their names, and then there, but there are other esoteric links between these two women in mythology. And that's still a thread that I'm exploring. It's been 12 years since I had that dream. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I absolutely believe that that dream was a memory and not a dream, that that might explain um, some of the ways women's wisdom has been preserved um, at the dawn of patriarchy and that uh, is available to us today to follow that thread backwards. So it was like this pre-patriarchal space where these women were gathering to name and preserve the qualities that they wished to survive patriarchy yes we're the source of our strength and our wisdom mm -hmm. yeah, there was a sense of urgency and a sense of secrecy about it all mm. wow i love those kind of dreams that um just continue to unfold you know the meaning continues to unfold it's um it's never a fixed thing with dreams especially big dreams like that there's there's always what you think and feel about it immediately. And then over the months and years, there's just new layers and levels of, mm -hmm. of meaning to get to. And those are, yeah, those are the big dreams that can really guide a life. 
Yeah, and think about Medusa and what we've been taught about Medusa. Um, she can turn men into stone with one look. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she's she needed to be beheaded. Um, there's, you know, Medusa was is vilified, um, but she's also this really potent form of female rage and mm. and feminine justice. And why are we being taught stories about her needing to be killed? Mm-hmm. Well, and then the symbolism of the snake, too, as a deeply powerful female mm-hmm. earth-based creature. Right. And she had a head full of them. Like, mm-hmm. not just one snake associated as her familiar. Like, uh-huh. from her head sprouted many, many snakes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, <laughs> again, we could just keep going and going. But um, I'm, I'm very curious. I want to learn more about this practice you have of charting serendipity. Oh, yes. Well, that's something I'm also working on to bring out to the public somehow this year. So, um, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, serendipity has been the way I listen to my ancestors my whole life. And it's the way I have followed my intuition and... Um, been led here to Costa Rica, to this magical life that is hard, but is also more than I could ever have imagined for myself. And other ways, other smaller ways along the way throughout my life too, when I really needed guidance as I followed serendipity. And I realized recently that I never really um, was attracted to the law of attraction. (laughs) It never really resonated with me, and that might also be in part because I do identify as a marginalized person, and the law of attraction tends to work better for people who don't have to fight against institutionalized racism and Mm -hmm. other institutionalized forms of oppression. Um, But serendipity is something I believe operates outside of those systems. Um, It's something... That is very ancestral, Um, looking for omens, looking for signs, reading guidance in the mundane. That's available to all of us. It doesn't matter what your class is or your race or your gender identity. Like You have access to all these magical little serendipities in your life that only you can interpret. Um, You don't have to rely on someone else to tell you what they mean because it's all an inner... um, inner guidance that's presented in the outside world. And so I am working on bringing that out to people who might resonate with that. And um, I call it charting serendipity because one of the practices I've relied on is writing it down, keeping a little serendipity journal in my purse, um, writing down little magical occurrences that happen, even if I don't understand them at the time. And then what that does is One, it tells your brain this is important, just like writing down dreams. I'm writing this down, so this is important, so pay attention to it if it happens again. Um, Two, it serves as a log for looking back on when guidance served you or when guidance came to you, so you can, like, have evidence to support your intuition and to support your decisions, and that can be really powerful in itself, and then it can also be really powerful in encouraging you to keep following your intuition and to keep following these serendipity, serendipitous hints and clues along the way. And um, sometimes serendipities happen weeks or months apart, and it can be really helpful to go back and be like, oh, I got the same thing is connected to something that happened three months ago. Or longer. Or, this, or years. Or longer. As a lifelong years, exactly. journaler, I see. I look back in years old journals and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, exactly. And how fun is that when you, when you, when you do get to get, when you can see that you wrote that down and you probably wouldn't have remembered it if you hadn't, and, mm-hmm. but you did. And now it makes the, what, this present moment so, so much more potent. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've never kept a specific serendipity journal, but I've been journaling forever and that's, and I'm always interested in these things. So I do always write those things down and it's amazing looking back and seeing these things. And I was recently speaking on the phone to, um, a homeopath and we were just having, you know, actually the homeopathic remedy that we landed on for me, my constitutional remedy is salmon. 
And um, it was just amazing. All the synchronicities that were coming in uh. with everything she was saying and I was saying. And we were just like, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know, like laughing and crying. And um, she was like, and you're getting me back to be interested in herbalism again. And I was like, yeah, well, actually, like my whole approach to herbalism is like story medicine and mm. synchronicity. And she was like, yeah, it's like, and she said, um, when you're in the right story, there's nothing that doesn't fit. Mm. And I wow. wrote that down. I was like, exactly. And that's kind of what you're saying. It's like the more you're yes. noticing these serendipitous things that happen, the more you're paying attention to them, giving them weight, writing them down, speaking about them, the more they happen. Yeah. And the more they happen and like mean something important. Yes. Yes. I mean, and we make the meaning, you know, we ascribe yeah. the meaning to things. But then as as time goes on and more and more things happen, the meaning just becomes bigger and even more like outside of us and uh, uh, enveloping something so much bigger than just our little yeah. selves. It's my favorite and most practiced form of divination for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's what this podcast is all about. And I love, um, you know, I didn't know that you were tuned into that but of course I'm not surprised at all because you're tuned into your ancestors <laughs> and there's all these things all just meld together so well there's so much there's so much there and I always say that synchronicity is one of the ways our ancestors speak to us yes and it's the way the divine spoke to them when they were embodied mm. um, we have so many technolo technological options these days and I think we kind of want to over romanticize or over complicate some things when just like diets or like divination mm -hmm. and those things can be fun and useful for a time, but they're also dependent on some sort of technology that go away. Um, so these, these things we've been talking about, I, and the one reason I really resonate with your, with your message and your podcast as well is it takes you back to the basics and the magic of the basics and gives you permission to just let it be simple and easy and always accessible without a bunch of pomp and circumstance and ritual. And, uh, those things are fun, again, but sometimes you don't need them. Sometimes you don't have access to them, but you can still access the wisdom and the guidance and the support that has always been there for humans. Yes, exactly. I just um, had an Ayurvedic consultation and one of the questions that he asked and was on the form I filled out before is like, do you have a spiritual practice and what does that look like? And I left it blank because I just wanted to, you know, speak it face to face because I was like, I don't know. It's not like I like light a candle every day and do tarot and like, you know, wear my robes. I was like, it's just, I just, I talk to my ancestors and I go outside and I work with the plants and I love my children. And he's like, so basically just like human, just like doing human stuff, like the deepest spiritual stuff. I was like, yes, exactly. It's just yes. like, just remembering how to be a human on the earth. Exactly. Nothing outside of ourselves is needed. No. Um, okay. I think we'll wrap up. And so I ask you to tell our listeners where to find you and um, please talk about your online courses. So I, I watched your ancestral flame tending video. I did that course. And, and one thing that you said that I wanted to bring up too before we're done is so when we're kind of invoking our ancestors, bringing them back in, finding that connection again, a lot of what we like to do, especially for me coming at it from an herbalist perspective and being in community with people who are doing that is revive their practices, right? Cooking their foods, um, using their medicines, maybe singing their songs, things like that. But one of the most universal and deeply embedded practices of our ancestors was ancestral flame tending. Mm -hmm. They were paying attention to their ancestors. This is, again, a deeply human thing found in like every you know indigenous land-based culture that i know about so i loved that you said that at the beginning of this class and um so i'd love for you to talk about that tell us more about your classes um sure yeah uh, ancestral flame keeping yes like you say i think it's one of the most basic spiritual practices we can have i also think it's one of the most needed in the world we have been cut off from our ancestors by organized religion by empire and I think, again, that's on purpose. I think when you forget that you have ancestors, it's easy to forget that you have descendants. And then decisions that we make in our lifetime don't, they're made more casually because you're not thinking about seven generations in the forward. 
resource extraction doesn't matter so much when you're only thinking about the next 40 years versus the next 40 generations. Um, so I think that's intentional that we've been cut off from our ancestors and I think it's one of the most powerful ways we can reclaim our sovereignty and um, work with the earth, work with mother nature and I try to right all the many wrongs that are happening and have been happening for many generations. So you can find me at darlaantwine.com, A-N-T-O-I-N-E is how you spell my last name. I'm also on Instagram at Darla Antwine. And I would say I've got the, the Ancestral Flame Keeping course up and I have a course about learning how your cycles, your own internal cycles. And, the se- and how they go with the seasons. And I have a course about dreams. Um, but all of this other stuff that we've been talking about, the, the food connection to ancestors and deepening into um, an ancestral reverence practice and charting serendipity, all of that is forthcoming. So um, you can watch my space on Instagram or sign up for my email list for updates on that. That sounds great. And um, you're going to be doing a giveaway as well for my Patreon supporters for this podcast. So, yes. yeah, what's that? Oh, I'm going to give away two free ancestral healing sessions, and I'll be offering a discount for everyone else. Great. So, we did a session, an ancestral healing session. Um, I guess it was like two weeks ago, and I didn't know it at the time, but I had shingles at that that morning that day when we were speaking and I was in a lot of pain um I didn't mention it to you because I just thought it was like a really bad headache I had shingles in my head Mm. um but it's like you know my nerves in my head were on fire and it was on the right side of my body where I feel this deep connection with my right ancestors w-r-i-g-h-t um Mm. as the grandma that I was speaking about earlier with the recipes and it was it was really powerful and I'm so glad that you kept notes and emailed them to me afterward because I was just reviewing them. I had not been on my computer since that day because of this whole mm-hmm. shingles incident and then my brother-in-law's accident. Um, mm-hmm. But reviewing the notes, I remembered that moment. So I connected really deeply with my right lineage during our conversation who I do feel the strongest connection with in all my ancestral lines that I've discovered. Um, but I remember it at the end where, where you guided me to be sitting with my grandma, grandma, Aini, grandma, Wright, Who I knew her mom, uh, granny, Wright, Who I also knew as a child. And then my grandma's sister who we called grandma Jenny. So I knew all three of these women mm. when I was little and, uh, my grandma only died four years ago. The other ones died when I was a kid in the eighties, but It was just like sitting in a circle with them and I was crying and it was so sweet and um, just beautiful. And before we started speaking today, I brought this bell in here that belonged to my grandma and I ring it when I want to call my ancestors in. And it really has always been so powerful Mm. for me and I can feel, I can feel them. I can feel my grandma specifically like actually enter my body when I do this and, um, so I called the three of them in to, to ask them to circle around me while we had this conversation. And as you were speaking about serendipity, I'm looking out the windows and a, a gust of wind must have blown. Um, I think it's called goat's beard, but they're like dandelion seed heads, but they're much bigger because all of a sudden all these little white, like upturned umbrella seeds mm. start floating past my window. And then three of them come together and instead of floating right past like all the other ones did, they were just twirling and circling right in the ah. window frame for about a minute. And I was, you oh know, just immediately felt like, oh, that's them, you know, that's them. Yeah. And then the fact that it stayed and just kept twirling and stayed in my view for as long as it did, um, you know, like that serendipity and that's the meaning that I ascribe to it, but it's meaningful. It makes, it touches my heart and it connects me even more to them. And um, that's when you're, when you're in the right story, there's nothing that doesn't fit. Exactly. And how empowering for you to see that and then to know what it is and to believe yourself when you tell yourself what it is. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
So thank you so much, Darla. Thank you for um, guiding me in that beautiful ancestral healing session. I'm so glad we did it. And I'm so glad we finally got to speak today. And I'm really looking forward to um, sharing your work with more people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me the space to be on your platform. And yeah, I love your podcast. It's one of the ones I make sure I listen to every episode. Thank you. I love doing it. Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, Handmade Herbal Medicines, and a lot more at mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, be sure to click the black banner across the top of the page to take my quiz, Which Magical Herb is Your Spirit Plant? It's a fun and lighthearted quiz, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with the medicine that you're in need of. If you love the show, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash medicine stories. There's some cool rewards there, like exclusive content, free access to my herbal ebook and online course, and the ability to chat with me. I am a crazy busy and overwhelmed mom and adding another project into my life with this podcast is a questionable move, but I'm also so excited about it and just praying that the Patreon will allow me the financial wiggle room to keep doing it. Another way that you can support if that's not an option is to head over to iTunes and subscribe and review the podcast. That would be super helpful. Thank you. And thank you to Marie Sue for providing the music that I use. That's Marie with two E's, S-I-O-U-X. This is from her song, Wild Eyes, one of my favorites. Uh, Check out Marie Sue. Beautiful music. Thank you. And I look forward to next time. Bye.